Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I'm Dr. Mark Hyman. I'm the director of the Cleveland Clinic Center for Functional Medicine. I'm pleased to reach, greet you to our second Grand Rounds in Functional Medicine. Today's topic is which comes first, overeating or obesity, reinterpreting the first law of thermodynamics by Dr. David Ludwig, who's a professor at Harvard Medical School and is the director of the Optimal Weight for Life program. He's the director of the New Balance Foundation, Obesity Prevention Center, and has been a leading thinker in metabolism, insulin resistance, the glycemic index for decades. In fact, I first read his work almost 20 years ago and was fascinated by some of his studies and called him up and he actually took my phone call, which was pretty amazing back then for a Harvard professor to pick up a call from pretty much nobody. And uh, he's, he's actually uh, written an extraordinary new book called Always Hungry, which has been a number one New York Times bestseller. Conquering Cravings, Retrain Your Fat Cells, and Lose Weight Permanently, which really addresses this hypothesis that all calories are not the same, and that weight loss is not a math problem, and metabolism is not a math problem of calories in, calories out, which shakes up our current paradigm. And today you're going to hear Dr. Ludwig break down that paradigm, and uh, welcome to Cleveland Clinic, Dr. Ludwig. Thank you, Mark. It's uh, such a great honor to be here, and uh, congratulations on your new exciting center. Uh, that's wonderful, and uh, it's great to see so many people so early in the morning. We In Boston, we don't do seminars at 7, uh, so this is uh, it's wonderful. Well, according to a famous law of physics, energy can neither be created nor destroyed. When applied to living systems, we have the familiar equation calorie intake minus expenditure equals calorie stored. In humans, most of our excess calories are stored as fat tissue, so we can change the right side of that equation to adiposity. Now, according to the conventional interpretation of this law, Obesity is a, a failure in our voluntary, in the voluntary control over energy balance. So in other words, in an environment with ubiquitous tasty foods, it's easy to overeat. But in the same environment with screens, cars, and sedentary jobs, it's hard to burn off those excess calories. So they build up in the bloodstream as calorie-rich circulating fuels like glucose, lipids and the like, and then those calorie-rich fuels get forced into storage into fat cells, making fat cells anabolic, make them, making them grow, and then ultimately leading to weight gain and obesity. The simple solution, we've heard a thousand times, eat less and move more. And in fact, this gap, this energy gap between intake and output that's leading to obesity is really quite small. It's about 100, 150 calories a day gap, which if you maintain that gap over a few years, you'll go from normal weight to obesity. Or if you could simply decrease that gap, if you could reverse it, 150 calories minus a day, you would go from almost any kind of obesity to normal weight in a few years. So it sounds very simple. Just eat less and move more. In fact, the conventional view emphasizes the person's responsibility to take control of their energy balance. The USDA MyPlate website says reaching a healthier weight is a balancing act. The secret is learning how to balance your energy in and energy out. Now, the ultimate expression of this paradigm is the first USDA food guide pyramid of 1992. Because if you want to focus on reducing calorie intake, then you've got to love a low-fat diet. Fat has twice the calories per gram, per ounce, per bite, as the other major nutrients, protein and carbohydrate. So the thinking was that simply by reducing dietary fat, we're going to lower the amount of energy going into our body, and automatically shift toward a more negative energy balance. So we were told, in fact, to eat all fats sparingly, those, uh, you know, most of those dots, those little triangles at the top. Whereas a whole range of uh, low-fat but processed carbohydrates were suggested to form the basis of our diet, 6 to 11 servings a day. 
know, of course, things didn't work out quite so well. Uh, now, this slide doesn't prove causality, but it looks at the change in obesity prevalence as this low-fat diet became dominant, showing that, in fact, the U.S. public, under the recommendations of the government, with the food industry making all sorts of low-fat and fat-free foods, foods that were high in processed carbohydrates, you know, that eventually the U.S. public adopted this message with the proportion of fat in our diet decreasing to near the government recommended 30%, and during that time, obesity prevalence skyrocketed. So again, doesn't prove cause and effect, but suggest it suggests that this focus on fat reduction has missed something critical and is unlikely to be taking us where we need to go with the obesity and diabetes epidemics, and raises the question, why? Why has this failed? In the largest low-fat diet study that will probably ever, have, ever be done, the Women's Health Initiative clinical trial, 50,000 women were put either onto a low-fat diet or a control diet. Now, the low-fat diet, th this study was actually very poorly designed from a perspective of testing a low-fat diet in that it was greatly biased to favor that group. People in the low-fat diet group not only got encouragement to eat a low-fat diet, they, they got a lot of other helpful suggestions and encouragement. They got intensive uh, individual and group counseling sessions, I believe uh, 16 sessions over the course of a year or two. And the control group got just written educational materials. So we know if you just sit with somebody on a regular basis in a room and talk about their body weight, it brings consciousness to the topic. People are likely to lose a few pounds. That's called the Hawthorne effect. It doesn't prove in any way that small amounts of weight change were caused by fat reduction, so that very small initial two kilogram weight loss could have nothing to do with reducing dietary fat. More importantly, Throughout the study, there was minimal difference in body weight, despite a substantial and sustained reduction in fat intake. Nor, for that matter, were there any changes in any of the other outcomes that were thought to be likely to occur with reduction in fat, such as heart disease, breast cancer, or diabetes. So now that we have uh, many more studies that have been done with more rigorous designs, where the low-fat and the higher-fat diets are compared with equal treatment intensity, so both groups get uh, the same treatment, so in a fair way, we're now seeing that, the, that every higher-fat diet, be it uh, the, the, the Lancet Diabetes and Endocrinology paper, I was a co-author on that, that looked at all higher-fat diets, or uh, very low-carb diets or standard low-carb diets or Mediterranean diets, that all of these meta-analyses suggest that the low-fat diet does least well against these comparisons, raising the possibility that our primary focus of obesity prevention and treatment for the last 40 years has done more harm than good. We know that very few people can uh, successfully keep weight off, even a small proportion of their excess weight, over a substantial period of time. This is a National Health and Nutrition Examine survey, NHANES, nationally representative, which found that only one in six people in the US with high BMI ever rep reported ever losing 10% weight of their weight for just one year. Now, most of these people will be more than 10% overweight, and the time will be, you know, they'll be carrying that weight for more than a year for much, much of their life. And ultimately, this is likely to be an overestimate in any event, because most people think that they're a little taller and a little thinner than they really are. So this is a very discouraging. This is a very discouraging finding. In pediatrics, very much the same. Uh, depressing outcomes. Most interventions marked by small changes in relative weight or adiposity and substantial relapse. So we have to ask, why is this paradigm, calorie in, calorie out, just eat a little less, move a little more, been, frankly, a failure in practice? 
such that we're dealing with continuing increases, the latest data, continuing increases in obesity prevalence throughout the country, despite an incessant focus on calorie balance. Government, doctors, professional associations, even the food industry, you know, with the 100 calorie pack and such. Why is this paradigm that sounds so simple failed? Well, an obvious problem with this paradigm is it neglects a basic biological fact known in the research laboratory essentially for a century, but knowledge that seems not to have penetrated the weight loss clinic or the public health realm, which is that body weight is controlled by a series of primal and redundant feedback loops involving critical organs in the body, the brain, fat cells, liver, gut, uh, muscle, pancreas, hormonal signals that connect these, neurological influences, and metabolic signals. So that when an individual who is at a baseline body weight of either lean or an obese weight, whatever it happens to be the case for that particular person, is weight reduced in a low calorie diet, well, of course, they'll lose weight initially. That's the law of physics, uh, first law of physics. But what happens? The body fights back. We know that hunger increases, predictably increases with weight loss. And hunger isn't a fleeting feeling. It's a primal biological signal. Um, typically that the body wants more calories. Very difficult to ignore for even the short term, let alone the long term. You know, so the, the conventional approach of eating less, in effect, implicitly says you have to ignore excessive hunger for the rest of your life. How practical is that? And even if you could, it gets worse. The body has other tricks. If you do ignore your hunger, your metabolism will begin to slow down. This is a well-recognized event effect, a biological effect with weight loss, and these changes will predictably push body weight back down to baseline, explaining why so few people can keep weight off. But the opposite also occurs. With overfeeding, and this has been done with volunteers in so-called force feeding studies, they'll of course gain weight as well. But then what happens? Hunger vanishes, and metabolism speeds up in the body's attempt to shed those extra calories. In fact, people in force-feeding studies are oftentimes as miserable as those in the starvation studies. Once the protocol ends, you know, they're to, the, to the relief of the participants, you know, they eat less, and their weight comes right back down to where it started, giving rise to this notion of a body weight set point. And we intuitively understand this notion that people vary presumably uh, in large part from due to our genetics, and some people always tend to be lighter than other people. But this notion of set point has, raises two important questions. First, if there is a, you know, a set point uh, that is genetically determined, why has it been increasing across a population basis over the last 40 years? Why are we defending a body weight on a population basis that's 30, 35 pounds heavier than it was in the 1970s? Most importantly, what can we do about it? Well, we know that the conventional view can't be wrong in its equation of calorie in, calorie out, and fat storage the component of this view that, real, that is based on the first law of thermodynamics can't be wrong. But perhaps our assumptions about causal direction are the problem. In other words, maybe the arrows don't go from left to right, maybe they go from right to left. So according to an alternative proposal, something has an alternative hypothesis, something has triggered our fat cells to become overactive, to suck in and store too many calories. That's the primary problem. Something is triggering fat cells to become anabolic. And so they suck in too many calories, leaving too few circulating in the bloodstream for the rest of the body. Now, notice that this paradigm still ad adheres to the laws of thermodynamics. 
And you still have too much energy intake, energy uh, exp expenditure down, and fat storage. But there's one key difference. In the old way of thinking, the concentration of fuels in the bloodstream are increased. And in this way of thinking, they're decreased. And that difference has profound implications for how we address the problem. So according to this way of thinking, that drop off, that the fact that the fat cells are in calorie storage overdrive, they're sucking in too many calories, is the primary problem. The body sees not too many calories in fat cells, it sees too few in the bloodstream where it's needed. That's why we get hungry, and that's why metabolism slows down. The, the brain evokes the starvation response, especially when we try to cut back calories. Um, in addition to slowing down, making us tired, as we know typically happens on a weight loss diet, people get cold, tired, they want to lie on the couch. If they move, they want to move to the refrigerator. But again, even if they resist that and they get on the treadmill, as they're told, and they don't overeat, the body lowers resting energy expenditure, and it actually makes each movement more efficient, uh, which are hallmarks of the starvation response. So from this perspective, eating less and moving more is symptomatic treatment destined to fail it actually will make the basic problem worse. If the problem is that there aren't enough calories to satisfy the needs of the brain and the body consistently available in the bloodstream because they're being siphoned off into fat cells, then just eating less and moving more further restricts the fuel supply and sends the body further into the starvation physiology. Yes, you might continue to lose weight for a while, but that's gonna come more from lean rather than fat tissue and it's going to be basically biologically unsustainable. So what's, uh, and I actually wanted to make a metaphor to um, edema. You know, th it, you know, edema is a condition that we encounter in clinical medicine uh, frequently. It's a problem with too much fluid in the body. Um, but we don't treat edema simply by just telling people to drink less and pee more. I mean, we can give them a, a diuretic. But it's a very difficult condition to treat, oftentimes because the fundamental problem, again, isn't too much fluid in the peripheral tissues or the leg uh, or the abdomen. It's that there isn't enough fluid in the bloodstream. And, the bloodstream, and so the brain recognizes that and makes and increases thirst. So that complicates oftentimes the treatment for edema. People are very thirsty. Once you treat a, the fundamental cause of edema, if you can mobilize the fluid, that fluid leaves the periphery, floods back into the bloodstream, and then thirst naturally decreases, and uh, the individual just pees off the excess fluid. So it's, again, the same, same concept, that it's a distribution problem. And if we don't distinguish fluid in the tissues from fluid in the bloodstream, or calories in the fat cells versus calories in the bloodstream, we're going to miss a critical difference that has everything to do with treatment options. So what could be triggering our fat cells to be hoarding too many calories? In Avery's culprit is too much of the hormone insulin. Insulin is, uh, you could think of it as the ultimate fat cell fertilizer. It affects the availability um, of all of the key metabolic fuels. So uh, insulin promotes fat synthesis and deposition in fat cells, and it also inhibits release of fat from fat cells. Uh, it promotes glucose uptake at all of the tissues. It alters uh, amino acids and the like. We know that states of increased insulin action predictably cause weight gain, and states of decreased insulin action invariably cause weight loss. A child with type 1 diabetes, when first coming to attention, will have had inadequate production of insulin due to the autoimmune attack on the beta cells. That child predictably will, have present, will present with weight loss 
regardless of how much he's been eating, five, seven, even 10,000 calories a day. Without enough insulin, those calories can't be stored, and then they get lost, uh, both through the urine and metabolism speeds up because those calories have no place to go. You put that child on the right amount of insulin, and weight gain trajectory returns to normal. Treat that child with too much insulin in inadvertently, or treat an adult with type 2 diabetes with too much insulin, and excessive weight gain predictably occurs. We also know that drugs that alter insulin or genetic uh, variations that either increase or decrease insulin secretion have the same predictable effect. In animals, if you give them continuous moderate dose insulin, they'll develop mild hypoglycemia, they'll get hungry, eat more, and get fat. If you continue that insulin administration but restrict their food intake to prevent weight gain, they still get too fat. They get too fat by scavenging their lean tissue. We'll consider the implications of this uh, to diet in a moment. So if insulin secretion is an obvious culprit in making fat cells anabolic, what's stimulating more insulin today than before? Well, the obvious culprit here is dietary carbohydrate, both the total amount and the processing of the carbohydrate. In other words, the glycemic index, which describes how fast carbohydrate digests into sugar. So carbohydrate was proposed by a, man, a, a group in Toronto led by David Jenkins in 1981 as a, an empirical way to see how, to characterize how different foods, how rapidly they digest into sugar, raise blood sugar and insulin levels. The key point in this um, terminology is that not just concentrated sugar, but uh, most processed carbohydrates, white bread, white rice, potato products, prepared breakfast cereals, the low-fat cookies, crackers, chips, all of these processed carbs that flooded our diet during the last 40 years, you know, the starches are made of glucose in a long chain. When processed, they turn into sugar very quickly and have a high glycemic index. Whereas, by contrast, calorie for calorie, gram of carbohydrate for gram of carbohydrate, um, whole fruits, non-starchy vegetables, beans, and minimally processed grains, such as steel cutouts versus instant oatmeal, uh, those kinds of minimally processed traditional grains, have a much more gentle impact on blood sugar. And a term that takes both of these um, um, parameters into account is the glycemic load. Uh, it's the amount of carbohydrate multiplied by the glycemic index of the carbohydrate. So it actually um, directly describes how a particular food in a particular way of eating in a typical serving size will actually affect your blood sugar concentration after the meal. So it explains about 90% of the variance. Just looking at carbohydrate amount, as the American Diabetes Association has taught for years, misses about half the variance. So what happens after three meals that vary in carbohydrate and glycemic index? And how, how, how does this affect hormones and metabolism in a way that could help us test this hypothesis that I've presented to you? Well, in this study, we looked at three meals each with identical calories, uh, but again, differing in glycemic index and load. Uh, the high glycemic index meal was instant oatmeal with a little milk and sugar. 64% carbohydrate, 20% fat. It's actually, we had the instant oatmeal prepared from whole kernel oats, so it was a high fiber, technically a whole grain cereal, perfectly consistent with USDA recommendations. Um, we compared that to a bowl of instant oatmeal, same protein, fat, carbohydrate, in fact, very much the same foods. Mainly the difference came from the differences in processing, and also we used fructose rather than glucose. Now, fructose gets a bad reputation uh, for its effects on the liver, which is true, but it also has a more gentle effect on insulin secretion, so it's probably a two-edged sword. We took advantage of that effect 
to help the study. And then um, to power the differences between groups. And then we uh, also included a third meal, a vegetable omelet with fruit that had more fat, more protein, and no processed starch at all. So this, this is what happened to insulin and a key related hormone, glucagon, during the five hours after the meal. So as expected, insulin surged in, in yellow after the instant oatmeal. But glucagon, which comes from cells right next to insulin in the, in the islets, was suppressed after the high glycemic index meal. Glucagon is, you could think of as sort of the yang to insulin's yin, or maybe it's vice versa, if there are any uh, Chinese medicine experts here. Glucagon, in counterdistinction to insulin, pulls calories out of storage. So glucagon will be secreted after a high-protein meal to help the body to get the liver ready to begin to release glucose two, three, four hours after the meal as those nutrients of the meal are digested and absorbed and you need to begin to transition from the calories you ate to the calories you have in storage. But if glucagon is suppressed and insulin is increased, that's a metabolic double whammy. It's an overwhelming anabolic stimulus. So that's going to be signaling the body to go on calorie storage overdrive, not just the fat cells, but liver and muscle as well. And as a consequence, blood sugar after this initial surge, after the high glycemic index meal, comes down, comes down, and then begins by four or five hours to reach an actual uh, hypoglycemic range. This difference was 10 milligrams per deciliter, was statistically significant. You don't even see the error bars. The comparison was so tight here. And because the liver isn't prepared to, to run to the rescue, as it was after the other two meals. And in addition to glucose, free fatty acids, that's the other key metabolic fuel, uh, were suppressed more after the high glycemic index meal. So at three and four hours, this key time period in the postprandial phase, um, when blood sugar is dropping, this other fuel is present in limited amounts. It, it, it's suppressed under the effects of insulin. The body, the, the brain, perceives that as a, an energy crisis. Look what happens to the hormone epinephrine or adrenaline. That's an emergency stress hormone. You know, we think of it being secreted only at times of fight or flight, but from an evolutionary perspective, hypoglycemia is a much greater threat to our survival than is a saber-toothed tiger chasing us. And so epinephrine remained stable after the low and medium glycemic index meals, but surged to high levels after the high glycemic index meal. So same calories at baseline, very different metabolic and hormonal states a few hours later. And how does somebody feel with low blood sugar, enough and, and free fatty acids sufficiently suppressed to lead to a counter-regulatory hormone surge? Well, hungry. And when we gave subjects free access to food, they consumed six or 700 calories more after the high glycemic index meal. If a fraction of that difference were maintained meal after meal, day after day, it could explain much of the obesity epidemic. So what's happening in the brain at, as blood sugar is crashing? You know, that key time period. You know, many of the studies in the past have looked at the wrong time period, one or two hours after a meal. You know, if you fat, you know, many breakfast, many meetings early in the morning like this typically have the bagels and donuts spread out, you know. Thankfully, that didn't happen today. But let's imagine it, we did. We, you know, we all had a bagel um, with fat-free cream cheese and orange juice. The problem doesn't occur, thankfully, during the lecture. You know, your blood sugar is surging. You're feeling good. Your brain is feasting on all that sugar. The problem happens a few hours later 
when the nutrients from that bagel have been rapidly absorbed, and then, again, your liver and the rest of the body aren't prepared to pick up the slack. So that's what we looked at here. We did a double-blind study, hard to do in nutrition. In this case, we gave participants two milkshakes that had identical calories, protein, fat, carbohydrate, but one was made of corn syrup, so highly processed, and the other uncooked cornstarch, which is a, um, a starch that has some unique properties in being very slowly digested. It's used traditionally for some endocrine problems like glycogen storage disease because it releases, it's one of the ultimately most lowest glycemic index starches around. We further controlled the sweetness between these two milkshakes so that the participants couldn't tell them apart. Um, and thus, what we're going to be looking at now isn't um, effects of taste. Uh, we, looked, we, we conducted MRI scans of the brain four hours later during that calorie crash. And here's what we found. Um, as expected, blood sugar surged and then crashed after the high glycemic index meal. At that crash, four hours later, the subjects reported feeling hungrier. And then we did brain imaging with using something called ASL, arterial spin labeling which is a, a way of looking directly at brain function without having to superimpose a stimulus. And we saw one area that lit up like a laser. Um, it was so consistent among every participant that we had uh, extraordinary statistical power. We could correct for, other, for every other area of the brain and still get significance. This area is the nucleus accumbens. The nucleus accumbens is considered ground zero for the classic addictions of cocaine, heroin, alcoholism. It's a central critical part of the dopamine striatal pleasure and reward system. Raising a provocative question that the highly processed foods we're eating today are recruiting or hijacking primal reward circuitries in the brain, creating something akin to food addiction, not because these foods are necessarily inherently so tasty. You know, we've heard about the food industry designing these foods with fat, sugar, and salt to make them irresistible, but this isn't effect, this isn't, what we're seeing here isn't the primary effects of the taste of the food. It's not like we gave people a Lay's potato chip and then they just started wanting more and we did a brain scan. Both milkshakes had the same sweetness, and we did this scan four hours later. So, yes, foods can be very tasty, and tastiness can affect food intake acutely. But what we're looking at here is something else. It's the biological effects of food independent of its taste. And I'm going to argue that that's much more important to understanding long-term regulation of body weight than is the immediate taste. In fact, we know this, right? Because Think of palatability, you know, we oftentimes consider palatability to be an inherent aspect of food. You know, certain foods like those Lay's potato chip or, you know, the, the, just the perfect French fry or donut is just being so tasty. But palatability is not inherent to food. It's our relationship. It's a neurophysiological response to food, which is heavily influenced by biological state. Think about the last time, think about a Thanksgiving meal where you've fasted all day in anticipation of a wonderful dinner. And you finally, it's five, you know, 4.30 rolls around, you have that first bite of buttery stuffing, and it tastes fabulous. But what happens a few hours later after you've had too much stuffing and everything else, you've probably had too much dessert, too much alcohol, and now somebody brings you a new, fresh, piping hot plate of buttery stuffing. How does that taste? Well, it's going to be at least unappealing, and it might actually be revolting to you. Same food. The only difference is your biological state. Palatability is not an inherent component of food. It's a learned response to food. Just as the first time you tasted coffee or beer, you probably found them overwhelmingly bitter and unpleasant. But now, you know, many of us like coffee or beer because we've paired the pleasant effects of caffeine and alcohol to the taste. And that is 
that has changed the palatability of these products. All right, let's, um, let's look at an animal model to see to what degree these effects can be disentangled from confounding. In this study, we looked at uh, uh, a rat model that was at risk for diabetes, giving them identical diets, protein, fat, and carbohydrate, with the um, only difference being, again, the glycemic index of the starch, low versus high glycemic index. We further controlled food intake to keep both groups the same weight. And you can see on the left that we succeeded in that, that over the 18 weeks of the study, we kept both groups in green and yellow uh, weighing the same. But to do that, we had to begin restricting food intake among the high glycemic index animals. So what is that saying? To keep uh, the high glycemic index treated animals from gaining too much weight, we had to feed them less than the other group. So that means that their metabolisms were slowing down. So anyway, we succeeded in doing that. And despite keeping them at the same weight, they had substantially more fat and thus less lean tissue. Now, this is the next slide will be the one graphic one of this presentation. These two animals weighed the same. In fact, the animal on the right that got the high glycemic index was tending to gain too much weight. And so we did what the current paradigm tells you to do. We put it on a low calorie diet. And not only did we put it on a low calorie diet, we succeeded, which is something that is very hard to do with humans. And despite succeeding, the animal's belly filled up with fat and it lost lean tissue. It had sky high cardiovascular and diabetes risk factors. There is no way this finding can be explained by the calorie in, calorie out model of obesity. Let's come back to humans. Do we see in a, in a metabolic effect of calories? To look at this, we examined 21 um, adults who were, had high body weight, um, brought their weight down by 10 to 15 percent, and then put them for a month at a time on a low fat, a low carb, or a medium uh, low glycemic index or Mediterranean type diet, 20, 40, and 60 percent fat. And um, here's what we uh, here's what we saw. With this was a crossover study, so that. Everybody was, we studied everybody in each of these conditions. At baseline, according to doubly labeled water, energy expenditure was 3,200 calories a day. That's high, but these were big people, high body weight, so that's uh, plausible. With weight loss, that 10%, 10 to 15% weight loss on the low fat diet, their total calorie expenditure crashed, more than 400 calories a day. On the high-fat, low-carb diet, there was no decline in calorie expenditure at all. It was like the body did not know that it had experienced significant weight loss, potentially suggesting that uh, there would have been less pushback in terms of rising hunger in addition to dropping metabolic rate, uh, suggesting that um, individuals in this group would have been able to, at least from a metabolic perspective, continue this weight loss without the same struggle. Um, this difference, 325 calories a day, also could be the whole obesity epidemic. That's basically the, you know, the amount that we're eating more than we were in the 1970s. All right, what about the long-term effects of macronutrients um, and the big behavioral studies that have been done uh, through the last several decades. Well, the most commonly cited example is the Pounds Loss study. The study involved over 800 individuals for two years assigned to diets that intended to differ quite substantially in carbohydrate, fat, and protein. 35 to 65 percent carbohydrate, 20 to 40 percent fat, 15 to 25 percent protein. 
Now this isn't as big a difference as we looked at in the, the study I just presented of metabolic rate, but these are significant differences. If we don't see something over two years with this kind of a difference, we might ar argue that there's really nothing practical going on from a public health perspective. The individuals were given group and individual counseling, and the study concluded after two years that all of the groups lost the same amount of weight, very little, but there was no difference between the groups and weight loss. So this study and others like it have led to the notion that diet doesn't matter. You can lose weight on any diet, you just have to comply. That conclusion is false. It does not follow from these data for a simple reason. That this and most other behavioral studies suffer from a fundamental design flaw. That they do not achieve their nutrient targets. The reported maximum differences, you remember I showed you what the target was. The maximum differences at the, at the greatest point of the study, which is usually in the first few months, was less than half. So fat intake differed by only 9% absolutely at peak. Protein, 5%. And even these small differences are likely to be overstated. Let's say, uh, Mark, I recruit you into a, uh, a diet study and you know, I make sure that you're motivated, and then I tell you, I assign you to a low-fat diet, and I tell you for the next 18 months to eat a low-fat diet, I give you financial co compensation, and I say, Mark, what are you eating? What are you gonna say? Low a low-fat diet. That's called social desirability bias. In fact, when we look at the biomarkers, they're, they're virtually suggest that everybody was eating the same thing. No difference in triglycerides, a sensitive marker of carbohydrate. No significant difference in protein excretion, um, in nitrogen excretion, and only a very small difference in RQ. So let's say we were trying to explore a promising new cancer drug that could revolutionize the treatment of a particular fearsome, feared kind of cancer. And you assigned people to a treatment group and a placebo, but the treatment group didn't take the drug. Maybe they couldn't afford it. Maybe they didn't know where to find it at the pharmacy. Maybe they had some minor side effects that would have been easily managed, but they didn't have help with it. And then, then that study showed no difference between the groups in cancer remission rates. Would we conclude that the drug was inherently ineffective, or would we conclude that the study failed to test the right question? Well, the latter, of course. And yet we routinely make this mistake in nutrition research. Fortunately, there are some, a few better studies. Uh, this, for example, be, was the direct study, 300 adults who were assigned to um, similar types of diets we've been looking at, low fat, medium fat, or high fat, low carb. This was done in Israel at a nuclear power facility. So the individuals came in in the day, in the morning, checked in, stayed there all day, and were fed lunch at the company cafeteria, giving the investigators the opportunity to produce major differentiation in diet at that one meal of the day, and this being the Middle East, uh, many of these people took their main meal of the day at that time. They didn't change the diet 100%, but even changing one meal like this led to dramatic differences in outcomes uh, along the hypothesized direction. The low carb diet uh, in blue led to a rapid weight loss with some moderate weight regain. The Mediterranean medium fat diet was a little slower, maybe the tortoise to the low carb hare, but caught up. And the low fat diet was clearly inferior. Uh, Diogenes, same, uh, same implications. This involved a feeding component, so again, getting better differentiation than the big behavioral trials like pounds lost. In this case, individuals were first weight reduced by 8%, and then assigned to one of four diets or a control diet um, to see which would be most effective in weight loss maintenance. And the diets differed in either high or low protein, high or low glycemic index. So the combination of 
low, low, low protein and low GI, that would be the lowest glycemic load. And that led to perfect weight loss maintenance. No weight regain at all. That's a very rare finding in a study. The group that got the high glycemic index, low protein, that was the highest glycemic load. That led to the most rapid weight loss, or weight regain. And the two intermediate groups produced intermediate outcomes. This is the closest thing you'll find to a dose response curve, like a pharmacological study in nutrition research. All right, so let's bring this all together. I've argued that the highly processed carbohydrates that have flooded our diet during the low fat years have raised insulin secretion and programmed fat cells into an excessively anabolic state, leading to too few, not too many calories in the bloodstream. That's why we're getting hungry, and that's why energy expenditure is declining. But there are other aspects of our diet besides carbohydrate that also affect fat cell biology, fatty acid profile, protein type and amount, you know, animal versus vegetable. Uh, I should say that protein is insulinogenic. We do make insulin with protein, although we make glucagon too, so it has a different effect uh, than, carbohydrate, than carbohydrate. But too much protein can clearly be excessively anabolic. So, you know, the answer isn't just as much protein as possible. Micronutrients, phytochemicals, and we can't uh, conclude a conversation on nutrition today without mentioning the gut microbiome, which clearly communicates with fat cells, the brain, the immune system. Um, and beyond diet, sleep, stress, and physical activities, I, uh, you know, I, I, the one thing I feel badly about dra dragging you here at 7 in the morning is you probably didn't get as much sleep as you needed last night. And we know that sleep deprivation has potent metabolic effects. So in summary, I've argued that the conventional approach to weight loss, the calorie-restricted diet, is poorly efficacious in an environment with unlimited calorie availability. An alternative approach aims to reduce anabolic drive, leading to weight loss less fat, more specifically under ad libitum conditions. This could be accomplished by reducing total carbohydrate or glycemic index or both, or other qualitative changes in the diet. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not arguing that we need to all get, go on ketogenic diets for this purpose. Um, although in the last point, I think that that, you know, to what degree do people differ in their, um, you know, in the prescriptions that will be optimal for them? And might those who have severe insulin resistance, like type 2 diabetes, do best with more severe carbohydrate restriction, at least for a while, perhaps even a ketogenic diet? That needs to be tested. So in my, in my final slide, I'd like to uh, uh, suggest that these ideas that I have presented today perhaps are provocative, but they're not new. The editors of a leading medical journal wrote the following. When we read that the fat woman has the remedy in her own hands, or rather between her own teeth, uh, there is the implication that obesity is merely the result of unsatisfactory dietary bookkeeping. Although logic suggests that body fat may be decreased by altering the balance sheet through diminished intake or increased output or both, the problem is not really so simple and uncomplicated as it is pictured. And this, uh, these words were written by the editors of the journal JAMA in 1924. And I'll also note that uh, I extensively explore uh, the history and the, in, the science of this uh, hypothesis or theory in my new book, Always Hungry, including a program to put these principles into effect uh, in your patients' lives. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, David. So uh, thank you for that brilliant review of uh, metabolism and obesity. I, I think there's a few minutes for questions, if anybody has any questions for David. Uh, feel free to ask questions. Please. Thank you. Um, what is, so for people that have developed insulin resistance, and obviously that's a huge spectrum of young, what is your intuition about how long or the factors that might play into how long it would take to reset? And if you were designing a study, let's say, what would you follow? 
Yeah, uh, let's see if I can quickly find this. I had to skip over it, um, uh, but I think I can get to it in a second. Here it is. So um, this was that uh, feeding study I told you about where we brought weight down by 10 to 15 percent and then put people on one of these three diets for a month. And we found something interesting. Now, this, these aren't individuals with type 2 diabetes, but they were all, they all had obesity and presumably, you know, substantial insulin resistance. We found that after the very low carbohydrate diet, the beta cells calmed down. So the time after, you know, you do an oral glucose tolerance test to see how fast and how much insulin is secreted, and after the low-carb diet, the time to maximum insulin secretion increased by 22 minutes, or about 50%. So the beta cells weren't as overreactive. They were a little more blasé about carbohydrate. And that would be a good thing uh, from a metabolic perspective, and in fact, we saw that. For the individuals randomly assigned to the low-carbohydrate diet first, if you got that first, the effects persisted so that when you got the low-fat diet, your metabolism didn't slow down. If you got the low-fat diet first, then your metabolism really crashed. So a low-carb diet, you might not need to be on it for the rest of your life. Um, and in fact, this is how we designed the three-phase program in our book. The first phase is 50% fat. The idea is you want to we really want to, and no grains and no sugar, really want to calm those beta cells down. But then you don't necessarily have to stay that restrictive with 7 to 10 billion humans in the world. We, you know, we need grains. You know, we're not going to feed the population as hunter-gatherers. But by resetting metabolism and especially keeping those grains less processed, you may be able to tolerate uh, a significantly larger amount than would have been the case previously you know, before that treatment. Other questions? Do you think, do you think yeah. there's any validity to a more personalized approach as in metabolic typing or whether people are fast or slow oxidizing? Is there a validity to metabolic typing? So there, you know, this, this uh, has been a topic of interest really for centuries. I mean, Ayurvedic Indian medicine has kapha, pitta, and vata, and based on your type, you eat differently. Then there was the eat right for your blood type diet, which was very popular. I think if you're one blood type, you can eat goat, but not cow. And if you're another, you're supposed to be mostly vegetarian. So I don't understand what the bio, I don't see a biological mechanism, uh, a convincing biological mechanism for blood type diets. I do for insulin secretion. There are some people who are low insulin secretors and that's easy to determine with an OGTT, or you can simply look at body habitus. If you see a lot of fat around the midsection, that person's likely to be a high insulin secretor. That person's gonna be exquisitely sensitive to processed carbs. We've shown that, I didn't have time to show that in this study, but we published another study in JAMA 2007. If you're a high insulin secretor, you're gonna do especially badly on a low fat diet. If you're a low insulin secretor, you have a little more flexibility and you actually get eating a little less fat might actually not be a bad thing for you. And, but we clearly need to understand that and other biological predictors so we get, get be, be beyond the one size fits all. It's not just, but lastly, I wanna say that this is not just a genetic thing, which you know, like the blood type diet might imply because your blood type doesn't change. The same genetic population that's either lean, like the Pimas in Mexico, or the Pimas you know, on an Indian reservation in Arizona with severe insulin resistance are going to need different diets independent of their genes.
Yes. Yeah. Right. I think it's a dynamic state. It's the key point is, like many physiological states, you've got to look at the dynamic state of development to understand what's going on. If you look after the fact, you may miss it. So, for example, in, um, you know, when you give a, uh, you know, Lasix to a patient who hasn't gotten it before, you get a dramatic change in excretion of sodium and fluids, and you can see that, and it's black and white. But you keep giving Lasix, you reach a new steady state where excretion and intake become balanced, and you see no effect of Lasix. Lasix is just maintaining that state. It's not leading to any new shift in fluid or sodium balance. And the same thing, I think, applies in obesity. During, we want to understand the mechanisms during its dynamic stage of development with the weight gain. The person you've described is likely, I mean, they, they may not be gaining weight anymore. They're just maintaining a massive degree of overweight. Or, you know, there could be a, an element that their tissues are becoming, you know, they're developing severe secondary changes, like the brain is becoming leptin resistant. Um, chronic inflammation in the hypothalamus, such that you're no longer responding to appropriate signals that would otherwise be the case. Um, but again, I think that uh, we've got to understand what's happening during that rapid rate of weight gain to test this theory. Well, in, co coincidentally, yesterday I was just uh, reviewing, uh, catching up on Medline, and there was a meta-analysis that was just published, uh, so a systematic review meta-analysis of glycemic index in pregnancy, and they argued, of course, that we need better studies. You know, these mostly they're behavioral studies where it's hard to change people's behavior, but even with the poor quality of research, they argued that the available literature suggests a benefit to the fetus, developing fetus, a lower risk of fetal macrosomia um, with a lower glycemic index diet. You know, again, if your blood sugar isn't surging as much after a meal, you're not pushing as much glucose across the placenta, the fetus isn't secreting as much insulin, and you're not getting the same stimulus to fat storage. We did a pregnancy intervention, um, and we saw less, uh, we saw uh, that uh, the mothers in the higher fat, lower glycemic index group delivered perfectly on time. It was about 39 and a half weeks. Those in the, low, in the high glycemic index group delivered 10 days earlier. There was a statistically significant difference, 37.9 weeks. 10 days, if that's a real difference, would be hugely important to the public health consequences of, of early delivery. Even within term, 37 to 42 weeks, 10 days of development may, matters. And our argument was that uh, a placenta that's affected by chronic inflammation and uh, stress hormones produced by a high glycemic index diet, that's not optimal for uh, fetal outcomes. Mark, how much are we doing on time? Uh, so, sounds like we're done. Okay. Thank you, thank you, David, and thank you all for coming. And November 4th, for all of you, we're having a day in exploring functional medicine model using a case-based approach. We invite you all to come. The next Grand Rounds for Functional Medicine is September 23rd. So, hope you join us then. Thank you. <laughs>